Good morning, everyone. Again, it's good to be back with you. <clears throat> it's always good to be a part of a church family. I always look forward to fellowshipping with God's people. That's my desire, and hopefully it is yours too. Today my sermon is a little bit unusual <clears throat> in that the title of it at least might sound as if it's going to be a dry sermon. Hopefully my other sermons doesn't sound that way. <clears throat> But I feel that it will be a insightful uh, information that we need to understand for there are, well, I'll give the title of my sermon, Prophets. There are some churches today who feel that prophets are still in order, that prophets, to, prophets today are ordained of God and uh, from that standpoint I think we need to understand what the scriptures has to say and seemingly there is a scripture that would support that and they use this also to support their modern day prophet turn to Amos the book of Amos And the third chapter, Amos 3 and verse 9, or verse 7, it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Now notice that. The Lord is not going to do nothing. But he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. This tells us that God will not do anything directly to the people, but he will go, he will tell the prophet, and the prophet will tell the church or the people <clears throat> the message from God. And that's the way it was in olden time. God did not speak to the church as a whole after Mount Sinai. I believe Mount Sinai, when he gave the commandments, was the only time that God spoke to the masses openly and with sound of which they all heard it at the same time. He did speak to different individuals outside of the prophets, but this tells us very plainly that uh, if God has a message for the group as a uh, as a whole that he will reveal it through the prophets. And as I said, this is used today to try to show that there is a need of latter-day prophets. But there is a scripture that seems to refute that idea. Turn to Luke, the 16th chapter. Luke, the 16th chapter. Luke was inspired to write this for our consideration today. Luke 16 and verse 16. And these are the words of Jesus himself. The law and the prophets were until John. Now this seems to indicate that John was the last prophet. Now there are scriptures in the New Testament where various, one, where, where various ones prophesied. But there was a difference between the two of them. The prophets that he's spoken about here until John was one where we would describe would have a soapbox and they have a message of doom or something which the people ought to do specifically. But the prophets in the new scriptures seems to indicate that they use the scriptures to prophesy 
things of the future or to inform the people. <clears throat> There's a difference in the meaning of the two prophets. There was, a, I think there was a scripture that even some of the daughters of a man, it says they, they accepted the Lord and prophesied. <clears throat> but here it tells us that the law and the prophets were until John. He was the last of the prophets that had a soapbox, so to say, and had a very important message for the people to hear. Now the church in olden time had the same problem as we have today when it comes to proving whether a prophet is a true prophet or those who preach the word today, are they preaching the truth? Turn to Isaiah, Isaiah the eighth chapter. Let's see the yardstick that they were to use to measure the truth of a man, man's words. Isaiah eight and verse 20 says to the law and to the testimony the law of God or the testimony of the prophets in other words if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them yes the people was to determine whether the things that was being told them was actually from God or not whatever he said was not to be contradictory to the law of God or to what the prophets has, uh, had already said that were true and ordained of God. Anything contrary to that, God says there's no light in them. And there's another verse I never thought until this morning about. It says if they speak something and it doesn't come to pass, then you can be sure also that they're a false prophet. There was no ifs or buts about it. In other words, excuses that it didn't come to pass. And we today, the Bible, the New Testament very plainly tells us to test the one who's doing the speaking. You are to test me and make sure what I teach you is according to Scripture. You will not be able to say in the judgment day, well, the Lord, Brother Walker said this and I believed him. Well, you might believe me, but that's not going to make it true if it's not true. So you need to prove who speaking from the pulpit is speaking the truth. <clears throat> Let's get into more into our subject this morning. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. There were different kinds of prophets. But I think we can agree that Moses was the greatest. He seems to just be more prevalent, more outstanding in the eyes of the people. And there's a script that does say that Moses was perfect. His family was, his household was perfect. But here, <coughs> Moses makes a prophecy. Deuteronomy 18 First of all, verse 15. Moses tells the people, he says, The Lord thy God will rise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. 
Moses here is prophesying 2,000 years ahead of time that Christ was going to come. Now, the word Messiah is not mentioned. The word Christ is not mentioned. But he says a prophet. God is going to pick from among you. And him you need to listen to. In verse 18, God is speaking through Moses and said, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I have commanded him. God is also speaking here, verifying what Moses has already said. And God said, I will put my words in his mouth. And that's why we do not go along with m much of the things that are being preached today, because Christ taught contrary to what is being taught today. As I said in Sabbath school lesson today, the Christian station that I listen to, they are constantly lamenting and, 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 and having a, a strong desire that the people would understand and hear the word of God and obey the word and follow the Lord. But yet they are preaching things that are contrary to what Christ said. And the people are listening to them. They're not taking the admonition of the scriptures to prove what is being said from the pulpit unto them, whether it is the truth or not. Yes, God says, I will put my words in his mouth. <clears throat> And the people are to listen to him. Turn to Acts, the third chapter. Acts, the third chapter. Here Moses is mentioned. Acts, the third chapter. I'll get there in just a moment. Acts 3 and verse 22. Luke, as he wrote the book of Acts, he says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God rise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Luke is quoting Moses. And Luke is supporting the idea that Christ was the Messiah that came. And he's describing him here. And he says that this is what Moses prophesied unto our people. And using mine own words, he's saying it's being fulfilled. Christ is the one that came and died for the salvation of the human race. But notice the warning in verse 23. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now that is not politically correct to preach that today. It's not politically correct from the pulpit to say that there's false ministers in the world today because we want everyone who mentions the name of Jesus to be a part of God's family. But it's sad to say that's not going to be so. In fact, we can see we're seeing it being fulfilled today. The churches that are mentioned in Revelation, the daughters of the false church mentioned in Revelation 17, I think. 
I guess I better make sure that that's correct. Revelation. Yes, it is 17 verse 5. The fourth part of it speaks about a woman riding the beast. And that could not be nothing else but the Catholic Church. Guiding the beast, telling the beast what to do, when to do, how to do. For 1260 years. But the time came when she gave birth to daughters, other churches in other words. But notice the wording that he used. It says she's a mother of harlots. They were impure when they were born. <clears throat> and so Luke tells us here, every soul which will not hear that prophet is going to be destroyed. The only thing that's going to save us, brethren, is the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There is no way that we can believe the things contrary to what Jesus spoke and still be saved. Now Luke tells us here that the Messiah has come. How did they know? Why were they looking for him at that time? Now is the time when I would like for you to take what was in your bulletin and turn it. Uh, I had turned mine over. You don't have to turn yours over. But let, let us go back to Daniel, the ninth chapter. Daniel, the ninth chapter. We're going to, see, going to see here how they knew that the time had come for the Messiah to make his appearance. Daniel 9, beginning with the 24th verse. Daniel 9, 24. Daniel says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Seventy weeks. Now, I'm not going to explain everything all at once here. But you take the graft, or what, what do we call this? <laughs> uh, well, what I put in your bulletin. Insert. Insert. Okay, that, well, that wasn't what I was, but it'll, it'll diagram. diagram, okay. <clears throat> you take the 49 years first. You add that to 434, then you add 7 to that, <clears throat> and you come to 49 weeks, or 490 years. <clears throat> and that's what Daniel is talking about here. 70 weeks. I think that's what I said, wasn't it? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. He gives us the totality of the years. After that, he begins to break it down. <clears throat> well, let's read the seventy weeks again. Seventy weeks are de determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for the iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. 
and to seal up the vision and prophets and, and to anoint the holy, the most holy. <clears throat> In other words, wherever we begin here, and it's going to tell us here shortly, <clears throat> at the end of the 70 weeks, the plan of salvation is going to be assured. Christ is going to be anointed within that 400 and or the 49 weeks, 490 years. <clears throat> Christ died in AD 33. That's the end of the of the 70 weeks or 490 years. That's the totality of it. Now let us begin to break it down. In verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. <clears throat> Seven weeks is 49 years. 457 was the last degree, decree. There were two de decrees for the walls of Jerusalem. And I think Nehemiah was the one that was given permission to go and rebuild the walls. But you, you start counting from the last decree to build the walls, and that was given in 457. Go home and check your history and make sure that I'm right. 457 is when the decree went forth. And apparently it took 49 years for them to start bi actually building the wall, getting the material together and, and so forth, I suppose. I do not know. <coughs> But you start counting, according to Daniel, when the decree went forth to rebuild the walls. <clears throat> now verse 26. Now after three score and two weeks, a score is 20, three score would be 60, and two, and after 62 weeks, <clears throat> the, shall the shall Messiah be cut off not for himself <clears throat> the the 62 weeks was fr from the time they started building actually building the wall unto the anointing of the Messiah. <clears throat> Something is going to happen in the, in the last week. Verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In other words, Christ is going to preach and then someone else is going to preach. But his covenant is going to be confirmed for one week or seven years. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation, ob oblation to cease. Christ is going to die in the midst of that week. Now, some individuals use this to show that Christ was, was uh, 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 crucified in the midst of the week. Now, prophecy may have twofold, I don't know, but I've just never used that. For this here is a prophetical week. He's talking about not a literal seven-day week. But Christ is going to be die, uh, going to be put to death in the midst of that seven years, or the seventh week, 
or the uh, yes uh, of the uh, uh, of that week which would be a day for a year seven years Christ pre preached for three and a half years Christ told his disciples when I die I'm paraphrasing now when I die don't go to the rest of the world but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel preach to them <clears throat> about me and my resurrection and my death and so forth. And Paul, after the other three and a half years was over, in other words, the disciples uh, uh, preached for the other three and a half years, when Paul realized that that three and a half years was up, he told the Jews, his own people, it was necessary. Now you remember the verse when I quote it. It was necessary that the gospel should be first preached to you. That's in Acts 15, I do believe. But it says, lo, since you refuse it, lo, I'm turning to the Gentile. That was the turning point that the gospel was to go to all the world. And today, the gospel is still going to the rest of the world. But they, at the end of that prophetical week, seven years, everything was complete as far as man's salvation was concerned. Okay, that's... Oh. All that I can remember that I need to say. Let's go back to John, no, not back, but let's go now to John, the first chapter. I'm back to my notes. But you can keep that and file it somewhere in your home. And if you want to study the prophecy of Nehemiah and also Daniel 9, well, you can pull it out and refresh your memories. I always have to refresh my memory whenever I speak on it. So <clears throat> we do need uh, things to read uh, and along with the Bible to understand the Bible. In John, the first chapter, John, the first chapter in the 19th verse, beginning 19th verse. This is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Now, why are they interested as to who he was? Let us notice the next verse. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now, why would that thought come to his mind? Because the time was when Christ was going to make his appearance. They knew that. They understood what Daniel was telling them. And they knew that the time had come for Christ to make his, the Messiah, I should say, make his appearance. And there, John was, was really making a dent in in uh, 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 their teaching as far as God is concerned. He was the forerunner of Christ. But it says, I'm not him. I'm not him. Now verse 21. And they ask him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art, notice now, art thou that prophet are you the prophet we've been looking for are you the messiah that Daniel spoke about that was going to come and he answered no no I'm not <clears throat> verse 23 here he tells them who he is he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah, in other words. 
Isaiah told the people that the forerunner was going to come. But John recognized the Messiah. Notice verse 29. The next day, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John recognized him. I'm sure the Spirit of God told him, This is he that they were asking about. <clears throat> this is he that they have been waited that they had been waiting for. Hurrying on because my time is so um, is getting uh, close up on me and I need to to press on. Turn to John the sixth chapter. John the sixth chapter. This is referring to Christ, I do believe. John 16, verse 14. Uh, yes, I'm in the wrong book, chapter. John 6, verse 14. And these men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. What did the miracles do to the people? It uh, uh, authenticated his lordship. It authenticated his messiahship. It told the people no one could do this except he that had the power from God. People wonder today why there are not more miracles in the church. <clears throat> I'd like to remind us before I answer that. Remember Paul? <clears throat> At one time, he even sent... sent a, handkerchiefs that was anointed with oil out to the people and told them to put it on your body, they were healed. That was during the time of that three and a half years. Miracles were still being performed to authenticate in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus, be healed. It authenticated their message of the Messiah that had come. But a little later on, I've shown you and I could show you again, where Paul left behind one of his co-workers, left him behind sick. Left him behind sick. You'll find that in Timothy. God had authenticated Christ's sonship his messiahship and we are to accept it on faith today that he was the son of God God does not have to authenticate his sonship his messiahship continually he expects us to accept it on faith I cannot tell you why when we pray for somebody that everyone is not healed. It's the times in which we live. Sin is a part of life. Man brought this upon himself when he disobeyed Satan in the Garden of Eden. Sickness, illness is a part of sin. We live in a sinful world. And we should not feel because I'm not healed or my friend or my wife or my children is not healed. I just don't have enough faith. 
No, brethren, it's not that. We just have to leave it in the hands of God. <clears throat> in Luke, the fourth chapter, let us notice one other thought, how that Christ let him know that he was the Messiah that was to come. In Luke, the fourth chapter, in Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 17th verse, Christ, in other words, to give you the background, Christ went into the synagogue. He doesn't say whether he was asked to, to speak or not, but anyway, he says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went in into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, the recovering of a sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He read these verses that was prophesied of the Messiah that was to come. Notice verse 20. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him they knew what he was reading about in actuality he's telling them I am the one that the scriptures is talking about here and they couldn't believe their eyes he read and he sat down and their eyes was upon him to think that the scriptures has been fulfilled. He didn't tell them, I'm the one that this is talking about. No, he just read it and sat down. And they knew that he was referring to himself. In closing, turn to Hebrews, the third chapter. I had another reference, but it more or less just says the same thing. It says, in, it was Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, and it says, Christ was greater than Moses. But I would like to read Hebrews, the third chapter. I believe this is one that I just quoted, not... But it was Hebrews, the first chapter, the first three verses I was going to read. Hebrews, the third chapter, <clears throat> verses three and four. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all th that built all things is God. Jesus received more glory than Moses. He was the Son of God. And so, brethren, hopefully you're able to understand now why that they were waiting why they were looking why they knew or how did they know that it was time for Christ to come Daniel told them Daniel told them he didn't tell them the day nor the hour today Christ we read in the scriptures Christ says I'm coming back they had approximate time when he was going to come as a Messiah. But we don't have the approximate time. We have some signs that we can see and 
perhaps come to the conclusion that we are living in the time in the very end. But they were told so many years from the time of the decree that went forth to rebuild Jerusalem, Christ would appear and he would be cut off in the midst of the week and so forth. We don't have that today. But we are told that Christ is coming back. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. And I pray that we'll be among the righteous, enter into that glorious kingdom that he has prepared for us. God bless.